Welcome to lecture 25 in remote sensing. We will talk about here the thermal, microwave and high spectral imaging. So far, uh, we have explained optical data which is more or less in the visible part of the spectrum. So, in this lecture we will go beyond the visible part of the spectrum to thermal infrared part and microwave part and then uh, more of the hyperspectral images uh, where narrow bands are affected. So, each of these images they have their own merits and demerits. So, we will discuss that in this lecture. Let us begin lecture. So, if we are talking of the infrared part of the wavelength, so this is shown in the diagram here the near infrared part which is starts from 0 0.75 micrometer wavelength region and it goes to long wave infrared which is here 12 micrometer region. So, we will talk about that infrared part and this is divided again compartment has been made into near infrared short wave infrared, middle wave infrared and long wave infrared part. So, there are sensors available now uh, which are operating in this part of the wavelength region and they are recording mostly the emitted energy from the object and we carry out the interpretation from these images for various applications. So, let us learn that how the thermal images are helping us. These images were initially developed for military applications and not for civilian applications because um, they were used for uh, law enforcement, fire, rescue work, for security professionals or uh, maintaining the operation coal fire etcetera. Because when we are talking of the thermal, we um, are talking of the temperature difference between the um, features. So, this is the thermal image which you can see um, on the right side. So, this thermal image is showing us the land feature as well as the water feature. So, the all the dark portion uh, is a, a dark portion which is black portion it is, it is in fact the cooler portion of the water it has a, a lower temperature as compared to the other feature here also. So, all the built up areas you can see with the white because uh, they are uh, uh, having the higher temperature as compared to the water body. So, in thermal image you know we get uh, opposite kind of a contrast as far as the grey shades are concerned as compared to the panchromatic data. So, the features which appeared darker on the panchromatic data will appear lighter here and vice versa. So, these uh, uh, thermal sensors which are employed in the uh, remote sensing satellites, they are dealing with the acquisition of the data, processing of the data and then finally, carrying out the interpretation from those thermal images which are operating in the thermal infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum and these uh, uh, sensors are mainly collecting the radiations which are coming from the uh, emitted radiations which are coming from the different objects. And as we know that uh, the emitted radiation from the object will depends upon the temperature of the object, will depend upon the physical and chemical properties and the smoothness of the object. So, our eye, human eye basically cannot detect the differences in the thermal infrared part of the human eye is sensitive only in the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, but here we are taking the images in the infrared which is ranging from 0 0.7 to 3 micrometer region or thermal infrared energy which is 3 to 14 micrometer wavelength. So, uh, we cannot with our eye we cannot basically directly correlate the temperature difference cannot identify the difference. Uh, and quantitatively measure that we require some special kind of instrumentation in order to carry out the analysis of the thermal images. So, this uh, 8 to 14 micrometer wavelength region if we remember the atmospheric window diagram also this is the region where uh, the uh, losses are minimum. So, we can get the maximum emitted radiance in this particular region reaching to the sensor without much of the atmospheric losses which take place due to the absorption and due to the scattering. The diagram on the, the, the slide on the 
uh, right it shows the urban heat island. So, different colors here this is the thermal infra uh, red image and the different colors here are indicating basically the temperature difference they are related to the temperature of the structure. So, we know that these thermal sensors you know uh, they are working on that principle that they will capture the emitted heat and we know that uh, natural object or man made objects you know greater than absolute temperature all objects they will emit some kind of a heat energy may be a smaller and may be larger amount. So, these material when they are responding to this temperature difference uh, are captured by the sensor. So, sensor should be sensitive enough to capture these changes which are due to the temperature difference or due to the constituent of that particular material. So, we have for example, water, we have rocks, soil, vegetation cover, you know these are the different features which are present on the earth surface and these will actually conduct heat directly through them which we call as the thermal conductivity and uh, they will store the heat that is called the thermal capacity. So, each of this material is capable of uh, storing some kind of a heat and then emitting the energy when the temperature changes. So, as soon as the temperature changes they will emit some kind of a energy which has to be recorded. So, we know that 3 to 5 micrometer region and 8 to 14 micrometer region is very good where the atmospheric transmittance is maximum and that is a good atmospheric window region. So, that is why uh, we are carrying out the interpretation, collection of the imagery, interpretation and processing of the imagery uh, taken into that wavelength region and its processing is also different than the normal multispectral image what we see. So, here I am showing you the image which is showing sea surface temperature. So, uh, if you look at the uh, sea area only not the land area, but the sea area here in different colors. So, these different colors are indicating the different temperature range here also. So, we can identify the uh, temperature range uh, at any given time with the help of these thermal images that what are the different which are the cooler water, which are the medium temperature water, which are uh, the uh, areas where temperature is much much higher. This kind of a sea surface temperature study for example, the people have used uh, for fishing the area because fishes are available in a particular zone when the temperature is conducive to the fishes they are available there. So, uh, this uh, uh, in uh, these kind of images we can get in complete darkness. Uh, we do not require the source of illumination to capture such images or maybe the challenging weather condition. So, this is the advantage of uh, the thermal image that irrespective of the weather condition you are able to capture these images. So, if you look at uh, the, um, uh, the different kind of sensor or satellites which can provide us the thermal data. So, Landsat is a thematic mapper if you remember I showed you the list of the uh, bands spectral bands. So, there was one band band 6 in uh, thematic mapper which was ranging from 10.4 to 12.5 micrometer region similarly in the enhanced thematic mapper also then Landsat 8 in TIRS we have the um, bands which are thermal infrared sensor, then we have Terra Aster sensor, NOVA AVHRR, Terra MODIS and Sentinel-3 SLSTR. So, these are some of the exemplary list of the satellites and sensors which are providing us the data in different parts of the uh, thermal infrared region and how many bands data are available that is given in column. So, we can get uh, from Landsat uh, only one band data, but from Aster for example, we can get 5 bands, from MODIS we can get 8 bands, AVHRR we can get 2 bands. So, we can get multiple bands also from the uh, sensors which are specifically designed to operate in the thermal part of the spectrum. If we are talking of the resolution, well we are getting a medium kind of a resolution from some of the satellites. From Landsat we are getting 120 meter spatial resolution or 60 meter 
or Landsat 8 is giving us 100 meter resolution. But when we are talking of the MODIS where we have the 8 spectral bands, the resolution is 1000 meter which is of the order of 1 kilometer. 1 kilometer pixel size. Similarly, Sentinel 3 will give us one picture, AVHHR will give it 1 kilometer. So, when the pixel size, uh, spatial resolution of the pixel becomes uh, poor from medium to poor, then the area covered becomes quite large. So, but here we have the additional advantage, and the advantage is shown in the last column, which gives us the temporal resolution. Like Landsat, we get data after 16 days. So, 17th day we will get the data of the same area, thermal infrared data. But when we are talking of uh, those poor resolution satellites, which are covering the large area, obviously when they cover the large area, they can cover the earth surface very quickly. So, we can get two times in a day from AVHHR, one day is resolution or uh, 1 to 2 days temporal resolution we can get from MODIS data or Sentinel-3 SLSTR data. So, these are the kind of a temporal resolution. So, now we understand that if we want very frequent temporal resolution and still we have to correlate the features with respect to their temperature. So, we have to carry out some kind of a thermal study then maybe we will go for a, a coarser poor resolution data. But if the things are not changing so fast, uh, then maybe we can go for a Landsat uh, data. Uh, example is volcanic activity. Suppose there is a volcanic activity, so maybe we require very frequent data, maybe at poor resolution, it does not matter really, but we want frequent data in order to understand where the lava flows, which are the areas affected. So, maybe every day we would require the data. So, there the uh, poor resolution data will serve our purpose. Now, when we are talking of the applications of thermal images, there are very, very large number of applications. So, here you can see in the list, we have listed a few only and these applications are related to somehow directly or indirectly with the temperature difference. Whenever we are talking of the soil salinity, stress condition, plant disease detection or monitoring the irrigation scheduling this is useful. Sea surface temperature, I have shown you the slide. Uh, now, this is being used for weather forecasting purpose, air sea interaction modeling, climatic change study, this data is found to be very, very useful. Fire detection, in case of a fire, the temperature will rise. So, that these um, thermal images are found to be very, very useful in case um, the fire is there to detect the fire thermal pollution kind of a study, wherever there is a thermal pollution, the temperature uh, will definitely change with respect to the surrounding. We can identify uh, the surface material and the temperature which have slightly different temperature as compared to the surroundings and that could be the rock, soils, um, uh, geology, minerals. So, all that are where uh, we can have the pattern of heat. Uh, can be monitored for example, the volcanic activities. So, uh, thermal data of the hot spot area, these administrator and planners uh, require this kind of a data for example, the volcanic uh, active areas. So, they are very, very useful so that the advanced warning could be given to the people to go away with that region. The next in this is the lecture is the microwave sensor. So, we go now uh, further uh, uh, the part of the electromagnetic spectrum which is the uh, microwave sensor part of the spectrum. So, our wavelength region becomes uh, higher and higher in that particular region. So, you can see that the uh, microwave region will fall between infrared and radio wavelength region. So, infrared microwave and then it comes the radio wavelength region. So, normally 0.1 centimeter to 1 meter wavelength region we define as the microwave region and because this long wavelength region the radiations the microwave radiation can pass through the clouds, tree canopies, haze, dust and the rainfall. That is the advantage of using the microwave data. The, in the optical data we can get the cloud cover and if the 
environment is hazy or dusty then also we will not get very clear images. But here we will get very clear images because these longer wavelengths can penetrate through these. So, here the atmospheric scattering is also not there. So, that is why these microwave images have found to be very very useful. Now, there are sensors microwave sensors which are divided into two categories the active sensor and the passive sensor. The active sensors are those sensors which have their own source of illumination. They will illuminate the object and record the reflected and the emitted radiation. But there are passive sensors which will depend upon the emitted radiation only. So, we have these two type of sensors and they have the capability to capture the images day and night. So, they are not dependent on the sunlight. So, day and night under any weather condition the images can be captured to monitor the environmental conditions. So, that is the biggest advantage of microwave images over the visual uh, optical images. If you see now the microwave uh, wavelength region. So, these are the different microwave bands. So, here we are using the capabilities of these bands. Now, they are very, very useful for our remote sensing based application X band, C band, S band, L band. So, these have a different wavelength range and these are found to be very, very useful for acquiring the data and carrying out the interpretation of the data. So, I am showing you here passive microwave sensor, the images which are taken from the passive microwave sensors. So, that means they are recording the energy which is emitted from the object itself. And these uh, are radiometers or these are the scanners. They are working in the same way as the field spectro radiometer I have shown you. So, they are mounted um, on the device on the platform and their field of view is large to detect the change in the energy. So, due to the uh, variation in the temperature, uh, but they have low spatial resolution. So, you can get a very, very large area covered at a low spatial resolution and you can then carry out uh, the analysis part of it. So, these sensors uh, actually can measure the atmospheric profile, determine the water and the ozone contents in the atmosphere. As you can see water circulation, the air circulation model has been developed uh, using these images and the next one is the uh, polar region image. So, one can see the, the polar area, the snow bound area very, very clearly from these images. If you are talking of the active microwave sensors, which have their own source of energy and they can illuminate um, the object and then will record whatever is the uh, emitted energy and reflected energy from that particular object. So, these sensors can have uh, different back scattering properties uh, which is coming out from the different objects and targets. So, we know that what these will do is they will actually travel with the speed of the light and also um, if we multiply if we know the time of travel from the sensor to the object and back and take half of the time multiply by the velocity which is the speed of the light we can get the distance also. So, these uh, uh, sensors will uh, be very very useful to find out the distance uh, also. Uh, so, we will show in the next slide. So, it depends upon our illumination angle. So, whether the illumination is down vertical or it is slant at a certain angle and also the roughness of the object the smooth surface is smooth or the surface is rough. So, here the example is the uh, radar systems or altimeter or scatterometer. These are the systems which are called active microwave systems and they are sending the beam with the on source of light and also uh, recording the distance. So, this is a active microwave sensor here this is a uh, uh, SAR and what it, it is doing is it is sending actually in a slant way it is sending you the, the at 60 degree it is sending the uh, beam of light to the ground and then the reflected one is noted down. So, you can see that the area which is covered is quite large actually. 
So large area is covered. So if you look at the SAR image because of the not very good resolution, not very very high resolution, uh, one can now start uh, seeing the different objects. So you can actually see the different pattern from this kind of a one can see the water area, one can see the other features, the road features and the building features which are very clearly seen from the SAR images. So, SAR images can also provide high resolution data, um, work day and night uh, independent of the cloud coverage. So, that is the biggest advantage. So, whether we are acquiring these images uh, the airborne or the space bound, so they will emit the microwave radiation in a series of pulse from the antenna and then the radar will move along the flight path and the area which is illuminated right, is moved along the surface in a swath and then the energy which is uh, back scattered from the object that is detected and the time of travel is noted down and then recording the range, the distance and the magnitude of the energy which is reflected from the object a 2D uh, image of the surface can be produced as I have shown you the 2D image in my previous slide. So, th that is how the SAR images are recorded and this is the SAR inferometric image uh, where with the help of the inferometric diagram we can actually uh, find out the displacement which is taking place in any area may be due to the um, earthquake activity or some other activity. If you look at the different microwave bands and their primary characteristics. So, uh, if you see the band K, K and KU band, uh, we are using for astronomical observation or satellite communication purpose. But the one which are shown below X band, C band, S band, L band and P band, they are very, very useful to us as far as the remote sensing based applications are concerned. So, we are using the capabilities of these uh, bands and uh, using for various applications uh, whether it is related to the vegetation canopy or sea uh, glacier dynamics or maybe the meteorological application rainfall measurement. So, there are large number of applications for which this images have been used. I am showing you one example here where the seasonal change which is taking place on the ground may be the phenological changes in the crop etcetera etcetera. So, we are uh, we can actually have in the growing season and the maturing season we can have very strong back scattered in growing season we will have a very weak uh, back, um, back scatter energy to the sensor. So, let us monitor the area which is a, a crop dominated area with the help of these microwave images. So, that we understand whether we can carry out the seasonal change analysis or not. So, this is the sentinel image uh, which also provide us the microwave data this is 2005 and the another one is in 2015. So, nearly we have a difference of 10 years and if we look at these images now the, the water feature is appearing the dark black here, there is a river which is moving through the area and there is a urban area and then there are surrounding areas where there is a lot of crop vegetation cover is there and then there are road features present in the area. So, one can compare these two images and can find out the seasonal change also could correlate the features with the temperature also. Darker features will are the cooler have low temperature and brighter features will have the higher temperature. Uh, if we take the optical data for any area we have one basic problem and the problem is the cloud cover. So, sometimes we have lots of lots of cloud cover in a particular region and we are not able to get cloud free images. So, these clouds are obstructing the ground information and we are not able to find out what is below the cloud in order to carry out the mapping. So, this is the example of uh, 2016 uh, 15th April then 17th of May 2016 and 2nd of June 2016. This is the Landsat 8 OLI. This is a multispectral 
image. So, we are not getting the cloud free images from the optical data. But the moment we take uh, microwave data, this is a sentinel 1 image, mm, uh, this, this absolutely uh, we are getting the cloud free images 2016 or uh, in the month of April, in the month of May and in the month of June, same area. Uh, now, you can see the uh, area can be analyzed very, very quickly because there is absolutely no cloud cover and features are now very, very clear. So, Again, very large number of applications of the microwave data also. We can use it for agriculture, for urban land use mapping, discrimination of the crop types, crop condition monitoring, hydrology, forest cover, snow, soil moisture kind of a study. A lot of studies have been done to identify different type of soils and carry out the soil moisture study or the predict the soil moisture, snow studies, etcetera, etcetera. People have identified the biophysical parameters of uh, uh, from the forest, biophysical characteristics from this data with the forest. Then salinity, saline soil or sea surface temperature, suspended sediment con concentration, uh, shoreline detection. So, these are another uh, kind of a oceanographic related studies which have been carried out because this is. Uh, much more sensitive to moisture content and the temperature content. So, any uh, profiling of the moisture, pro profiling of the temperature in the atmosphere has been carried out. Climatic change studies has been carried out with the help of these microwave images. Now, not only on the land, but for planetary applications also like planet like Mars and Venus and the satellites like moon have explore to detect the presence of the frozen water, you know successful Chandrayaan mission. So, to identify the possibility of the water there, uh, you know people have used these uh, images, microwave images to carry out the study. The next is uh, hyperspectral sensor. So, when we are talking of the hyperspectral sensors, the hyper means over, you know lots of lots of things, over means quite in large number. So, that is the meaning of the hyper too many and refers to the large number of the wavelength bands. So, hyper spectral means too many spectral wavelength regions. So, any sensor which is giving me data in very large number of spectral wavelength region, this wavelength region becomes narrow, then these are called hyper spectral images. So, there are sensors which are specifically designed for that purpose. They will provide me more than 100 images in very, very narrow band and uh, the resolution of that could be 0.1 micrometer. So, that is the kind of a change which has been made from uh, if because the wavelength is uh, narrow visual to infrared spectrum and it has been sliced into very, very narrow regions. So, each region is 0.1 micrometer. So, there is a very slight change between band 1 and band 2, band 2 and band 3 and so on. So, but we have very, very large number of band and the idea of that is there are some unique characteristics of the features which we can identify from that particular narrow band. So, we are using that spectral characteristics of those unique features whether it is the mineral contents. Uh, uh, or geological formations of a particular object or different land cover classes that we can identify very, very accurately with very, very high accuracy using these characteristics. So, if we remember the spectral reflectance curve wavelength uh, versus the spectral reflectivity of different objects. So, we are using a similar kind of uh, spectral signature curve from the different objects and trying to select those best band combination in order to identify. Now, there are various sensors which can provide us the global coverage at a regular interval. So, Hyperion for example, earth observation one is a very, very popular. This diagram is showing us that uh, multi when we are talking of a multi spectral uh, sensor, it is operating in uh, the visible part of the spectrum which is shown from band 1 to band 7, but when we are talking of the hyper spectral, the same wavelength range has been now narrowed down, further sliced and we made hundreds of bands, more than hundred of bands. Then we have ultra spectral uh, images where we have 
more than thousands of bands. So, we are talking of hyperspectral data here where we have more than uh, 100 bands in very very narrow wavelength region. So, when we have very very large number of images of a specific area of a particular area uh, if I stack those images it becomes a cube. So, this is very popularly known as the hyper spectral cube whereas, from the multi spectral data I have maximum 10 images. So, these are those images which are shown. So, if I draw wavelength versus the response curve I can see these bar diagram, but this is a continuous spectrum. So, there is a, a continuum spectrum if I draw wavelength versus response. So, if I stack them together this is a hyperspectral cube of the data. So, this uh, uh, development was done of this hyperspectral sensor in mid 80s uh, with the using the principle of stereoscopic. So, this has actually converts the stereoscopy and remote sensing imaging of the earth. So, we are taking the characteristics of the stereoscopic and applying it to the image in order to classify very detailed classification. So, we are using uh, instruments like spectrometers or spectroradiometers to take ground based measurements. So, we have learned in our previous lecture also how to take the measurements or sometimes we are simulating them we are taking laboratory based measurements of those material. So, once we know the characteristics of those material which we want to characterize from the satellite images we are using that information as an input in order to classify the satellite images. So, uh, those image though this this uh, ground information or the spectral characteristic is very very important in order to successfully uh, analyze the data from the hyperspectral sensor. So, here if we take one pixel for example, this is the one pixel if we just uh, take that pixel out from the entire cube it looks like a tower of the pixel and each individual pixel here is characterized by a complete spectrum. So, if I draw the spectrum of that I may be you know I will get something like that. If I draw the spectrum of another pixel maybe it is a water pixel I get another spectral reflectance curve. If I take the another one for mineral content I will get the spectral content like this. So, I am now using the characteristics of this spectral characteristics of these three objects which is mineral, water and vegetation cover and trying to give that input to the data for making the classification. So, high spectral images technology uh, it is improving basically our capability to uh, carry out the detailed very detailed classification. Suppose, I have to identify different types of minerals which are present in the area different types of the geological characteristics that we can identify with the help of the hyperspectral images. So, this is the hyperspectral cube or the images it, it is not just measuring the each pixel, but also measuring the reflection, emission and the absorption of the electromagnetic radiation. So, here uh, every feature has a unique uh, spectral signature that is what we have learned and we are using the similar kind of a knowledge in order to process this image and discriminate from the other features. Now, you can see the spectral hyperspectral image and here the different colors are indicating the different types of uh, ground objects or the material characteristics which is present on the ground. This is widely used by uh, geologist for mapping the minerals. So, where there are a lot of applications you will find there on the mineral mapping. So, different types of material uh, have been identified with the help of this particular image it you can discriminate the feature surface features and the objects that traditionally we cannot identify with the help of the multi spectral imaging system. We can identify those small targets sometimes there are some unique targets that give us a unique spectral reflectance those small targets which are not able to identify from the multi spectral data we can identify. We can do a very good land cover classification of that. It is also improving our understanding of the plant physiology 
crop signs and geological formations because when we see the spectral reflectance curve of the different types of a crops or the growth of the crop with respect to the time, we understand the reflectance pattern and try to use that knowledge in order to classify that data. Hyperion Earth Observation 1 is the hyperspectral sensor which was launched in the year 2000 by NASA and the main idea was to create the mineralogical mapping. So far you know there were sensors which were used for uh, other resource mapping, but uh, as far as the geology is concerned as far as the mineralogical is concerned then uh, this was the specific sensor which was used. It is a based on a push broom sensor technology it was providing 8 bit data with the width of 7.5 kilometer. So, area was 7.5 kilometer by 7.5 kilometer. So, Hyperion image is shown uh, on the right side. Uh, then Everest data which was also Hyperion data it was available to us at a spatial resolution of 20 meter and swath width was 11 kilometer by 11 kilometer and there were several wavelength range in which the data was available to us from the average data. So, average data has also been used for a large number of application. If you look at the what are the different hyperspectral sensors. So, again the list may not be a complete list, but the exemplary list is starting from 1987 where we have the average data, then MODIS data in 1999, Hyperion in 2000 and then Chris Proba is 2001 and so on IMS 1 is 2008. So, we have uh, various years starting from 1987 when the, uh, the hyperspectral data was available to us in different spectral range and the number of bands. If we look at the number of bands we can get 224 bands data. So, uh, understand the the availability of the data is a huge data set available to us 224. Now, the question is that how to carry out the analysis and how to carry out the selection of the best band, so that we can identify the feature of interest. Spatial resolution was also ranging uh, from 20 meter, 300 meter, 500 meter. Temporal resolution was also uh, 1 to 2 days to 16 to 30 days and swath width was also changing is depending upon the type of the sensor and the height of the satellite which was operating. So, this uh, list is long here uh, up to 2022 you can see high XIM sensor uh, which was launched by France. So, there are different countries uh, which has designed and launched their own hyperspectral uh, sensors looking into the potential use of the sensor application of the sensor. But there are some problems also with hyperspectral data when we are using the data volume as I told you large number of bands are there uh, very very difficult uh, con there is a confusion that which particular bands are to be taken to carry out the analysis. Then cost is another it is a costly data and then difficulty in analysis because either we need a spectral library or we have to go and collect the data. Uh, our cells from the spectro radiometer and try to correlate. So, analysis of this data is slightly complex not as simple as we do with the multi spectral data. There are uh, several applications. So, this slide shows whether we are talking of the ocean analysis or agricultural or mineral mapping or the environmental analysis or medical diagnosis the hyperspectral images have application in all the fields. So, this is all about the three types of data products covered in the lecture. Thank you.